problem with strength is it always wanes. I always use the example of Hathor Bjornsson. I think he was the last strongman to win the Europe Strongest Man Arnold Classic and World Strongest Man all in the same year. But the day after he won the World Strongest Man competition, he wasn't the strongest man in the world anymore. Why? Because his body was all beat up from this crazy competition. There was some man on the planet that was stronger than him that day. So many people are focused on being strong in these areas, and the focus needs to be on resilience. No matter what, something's going to befall you that your strength can't withstand. You should never have a situation befall you that your resilience can't withstand, because resilience is the ability to bounce back. All right, guys, so uh, we got uh, Sean here. You haven't seen his hand yet. We're trying to keep him from getting shot with his hand because he's going to go out and he's going to get pulled over and the police is going to say, let me see your hands. And he's going to pull that thing up. Yeah. He's going to get lit up. Somebody told me the other day, bro, it looks like you're carrying a gun. Like, yeah, it's going to be a bro. YouTube video, bro. Yeah. Like you get lit up. Yeah. I'm going to be rich. We're gonna, too. <laughs> no, <laughs> you're going to be rich or we're going to have a George Floyd funeral for you. Like we're going to have like a gold casket for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey guys, we have a uh, we have my friend Kyle Thompson on with us today. The Undaunted Life uh, podcast or show, uh, man. Uh, if you hadn't heard it before, he's uh, you know I've been on his show three times. He's been on a lot of other shows, and uh, he's one of my favorite podcasts to listen to. And we we were friends for a long time, and actually, uh, I think we met at Tim Kennedy's book release. As yeah, DC in person. Yeah, and then um, and then uh, since then we've been just working to get you know, rep- reciprocate and get you in this podcast. That's right. Well, so. and, and I get to come for the first interview in the new days. In the new studio. Yeah, look, yeah. Look, right. look behind us. Uh, <clears throat> we got the new logo. Uh, is it the logo reveal? We might have, we might have revealed it, but it's the logo, it's a logo reveal, reveal no, on, on logo the podcast. Reveal. That's right. So behind us is the season two of the pod, podcast, the yeah. show. And uh, we missed the first season was stay dangerous. Second season is resilient. Although, uh, it's probably going to stay. Yeah. Uh, it's probably going to stay and we'll, we'll, we'll just work our way into that. But, uh, man, this, uh, logo behind us is, uh, it's kind of in the making. There's a lot of symbolism in it. Yeah. And, uh, and we're going to be rolling that symbolism out. Uh, I don't want to reveal it here. We're going to do a separate video later. Roll the symbolism out. of. You want to uh, tell them a little bit about resilient? Uh, uh yeah. Resilient as, uh, it's, you know, as we were picking the name for season two and, and, uh, some of the branding of future things from Mighty Oaks, we wanted a consistent name that just, embodied everything that we do and in resilience is uh for the last 12 years we believe that resiliency uh prevents uh all the problems that we see in a military and veteran community Tr- believe that over in a society it prevents the the, the problems that, that we see in our culture and life if people are resilient uh to the hardships of life uh they'll be able to withstand those things and, and not only bounce back on the bounce back or come another side, but they can be stronger because of it. And, uh, and, the, and, and we also have used that in recovery as we help veterans first responder at Mighty Oaks Foundation recover. We help them live more resilient lives by living the lives they were created to live through biblical principles and biblical living. And we've, uh, we just had tremendous success in that. So we thought these conversations are with, with people like Kyle and, you know, Terry Cruz, who we just had on and, uh, and, uh, Sean Ryan and Jay Robertson, and Uncle Cy, like we thought that the talking to these people who, from uh, experts in their own fields about what resilient means to them will be a way just to help culture through these conversations that we're having. And, you know, in the military, there's these, the word resilient is, is broken down into four pillars, mind, body, spirit, and social. So mentally being tough, having the right perspective, having the right attitude, uh, uh physically taking care of your body, being healthy, being uh, physically strong, being capable, uh, to do what you need to do as a protector, as a provider, uh, as a, you know, human being, um, socially surround yourself with the right people. You can't always pick who you can be around, but you can pick who you let speak in your life. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and spiritually I have a strong spiritual foundation for me. And I think everybody on here it means through having a relationship with Christ. That's what our spiritual foundation is. And so having those four pillars makes you resilient. What does the world need right now? This broken world that's hopeless. They need to be resilient. Yeah. And, uh, and that's what that's about. This logo, uh, you know, I'll tell you a few things for it. As I'm looking back at it, the Rudus in the middle is a Roman Rudus which is a symbol of freedom. Uh, Roman gladiators would either fight for their freedom and uh, through one major battle or through a series of fights. And when they won those uh, as slaves, as gladiator slaves, they would be given a wooden rudus that was a symbol of their freedom as a free citizen. Sure. And they carried that around in, in Roman society and people knew that they were a slave and now they're free. And uh, being resilient means being free. That's right. Stepping in a spiritual relationship with Jesus means being free. The four uh, grooves in the handle or the four pillars. Correct. The wings uh, on there symbolize uh, 
our, our military and and many many from a military and, and first responder communities the wings have a lot of significance me being a recon marine uh, free fall jumper those wings mean a lot you being a SWAT officer yep. uh and and, uh, and there's 17 uh feathers on those wings and those 17 feathers represent the 17,000 that we were able to rescue from Afghanistan which is a big part of history of mighty oaks uh as we move forward you'll see uh you know the logo will change a little bit um the 17 equal would be 18 the one missing is for those left behind in Afghanistan yeah. uh, through, who fought alongside of our warriors for 20 years. And then one of those feathers are now, but will be broken off to represent the fallen warriors. Yeah. And uh, in the, the red line to the resilience is the blood that shed by all those who serve uh, our communities uh, here, in, here in our nation and, and around the world. Yeah. The truth is, and I think this is important and, and everybody has a resilient story, but it's, do you know, how to develop the right mindset, you know, physical attributes, social connections, and spirit to be able to stand strong in the fact that it is your resilient story yeah. in this world full of victims and excuses. And I think that is what we're trying to do here on the Resilient Podcast is to highlight stories of resilience so that we can carry that to our communities and start to see a, a societal shift in the way we view the world. Which makes all, all this all this revealing makes for Kyle to be a perfect guest today because yeah. the undaunted life uh, show and in, in the mission of of, the, of undaunted. By the way, if you're if you're wanting to follow, it's undaunted dot life, not right. dot com, undaunted dot life. Which I love that uh, for a URL. So www undaunted life. And in part of his mission there is equipping men, and uh, I know you have a specific calling for men, mm. equipping men to, to push darkness, uh, to push back darkness through spiritual mental and physical resilience. So perfect. Uh, you, you are missing one of the pillars, social. <laughs> no, I'm not missing one of the pillars. I left it for you guys. Left like that. That's the difference. Yeah. That's right. but, but he hits the social through his podcast and, uh, and, and really touches it. And he's, you know, very much admire his, uh, his work and, uh, and, and, uh, some of the things he does, not just on his podcast, but he's just been a voice for truth. Uh, been super bold to speaking truth against the opposition. And, and at times, you know, and when we, people are truth seekers, it, it it stifles your platform, but you've done it anyway, and you've been bold and courageous in that. And uh, and I've, I've always really respected that of you. And it's just super exciting to finally have you on here, especially during this this, this new season of of, of our of, of our show. And uh, I want you to start. Off, I know you're from Oklahoma, but just tell us, you know, how did you get to the point in your life where you're, you know, you started this as your full time gig? Yeah, absolutely. Because <clears throat> growing up. In Oklahoma, you grow up in the milieu of Christianity, right? Whether you're a Christian or not. And I kind of call it, you know, uh, country music theology. So because you listen to country music and you occasionally vote Republican, like you're going to go to heaven because God likes those things. And so, you know, I become a Christian as a 10th grader. And so at the time, like I'm in 10th grade, right? So I'm 16 years old. I'm figuring out what it means to be a man while at the same time now trying to figure out what it means to be a Christian. Yeah. And so at the time I was like, oh, okay, I figured it out all the manly men are outside of the church doing man stuff and all the godly men are inside the church doing like God stuff, like praying for you, giving you limp handshakes, wearing khakis, like that type of thing. <laughs> <clears throat> and I just kind of carried that dichotomy into my twenties. Mm. And then I started really digging into the gospels a little bit more for myself. And I was like, man, Jesus kind of seemed like a rough dude. Like he always made people mad with the words that he said, like they, they took him to the edge of a cliff and they were going to throw him off and he didn't physically work his way out of there. He just looked at him and walked through the crowd and said, yeah, basically not today. Not yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. And so it's like, yeah. whoever touches me is probably coming off. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. I was like, well, wait a minute. Like this, this isn't the image of kind of the soft featured Danish model Jesus that you see depicted in artwork mm -hmm. and, you know, constantly carrying lambs and like telling women how cute they look in their tunics. And it's like, this is like a different type of guy. And I realize it's because there's this overabundance and focus on the Lamb of God and to the complete detriment and ignoring of the Lion of Judah. And so we love to focus on grace, but not really as much on truth, right? On grace and not judgment. And so I got this burden in my 20s for rough dudes that I thought were going to walk into Christ's church and see a bunch of soft, doughy men and walk out and, walk out and be like, nah, man, not me. Yeah. yeah. And so I was like, all right, there's got to be a way to bridge this gap for men. and so I helped start a couple of men's ministries and, you know, some of them, you know, did some really cool things, but I finally just, just like, I, I got to do something on my own. I got to be able to sprint in one direction as fast as possible. So I wrote a 21 day devotional for the U version Bible app in 2016. 
kind of forgot about it and then found out that it was like the second most read devotional on the app behind the lead pastor who helped create the app. I was like, okay, so I guess there's something here to this idea of spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. And then, you know, they wanted me to write another devotional and I was like, I don't really want to do that. Writing is kind of laborious. And so I was like, all right, I'm just going to put some words on a piece of paper, some notes, and then just flow into a microphone. And so that's, that's a podcast. We launched a podcast in 2016 or 2017 rather, but yeah, we're, we're here to equip men to push back darkness. And we do that by providing content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. And just real quick, the reason why I chose the word resilience as far back as 2016 is because men's ministries have two main problems. Number one, a lot of them are just women's ministries that have been repackaged for men. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's the same content, but instead of like doilies and, you know, flowers on the artwork, it's like wood and camo and like that kind of thing. So that's one problem. The other problem is they focus on strength. Oh, you need to be strong and you need to be do all those things. The problem with strength is it always wanes no matter what. Yeah. So yeah. I always use the example of Hathor Bjornsson. I think he was the last strong man to win the Europe strongest man, Arnold classic and world strongest man all in the same year. Well, the day after he won the world's strongest man competition, he wasn't the strongest man in the world anymore. Why? Because his body was all beat up from this crazy competition. There was some man on the planet that was stronger than him that day. But give him about a week or two of, you know, stretching and ice baths and, and massages and stuff like that. He's a resilient athlete, so he's going to bounce back. So many people are focused on being strong in these areas. And the focus needs to be on resilience. Because no matter what, something's going to befall you that your strength can't withstand. But you should never have a situation befall you that your resilience can't withstand because resilience is the ability to b- bounce back. It's kind of like you, you have those guys that are like, they should win the fight. Mm-hmm. They should win the jujitsu tournament on paper, but then the fight actually happens and you get clipped mm-hmm. and then it all kind of goes out the window. It's like strength is that on paper. Strength is when you're fighting on paper and it's like, oh, well, this guy's stronger than the other guy. He should win. But it's sometimes it's, you know, the size of the dog in the fight, right? Or the size of the fight in the dog rather. And that's, that's why I just, I love the fact that y'all are kind of moving more to this resilient mindset because we don't have enough of it and we need it. Yeah. I mean, that's what I've seen over the last 12 years and, and, and preparedness is everything, right? To me, resiliency is readiness and readiness is preparedness. And, and, uh, and, and I believe deeply that, you know, I've seen this as an athlete, I've seen this, uh, as a special operator, like through my whole life that a ounce of, a ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. Meaning if you prepare the front end appropriately, then when the hardships come, it's much better than dealing with falling your face and trying to fix it after the you know, damage control and all those things. So, you know, when you are intentional about having a resilient life, when you invest in yourself mentally, when you invest in yourself uh, physically, when you invest in yourself uh, socially and spiritually, when you invest in these things, you're very intentional about preparing yourself, then you're going to, uh, you're, you're going to be ready for the hardships. And when they come, you got to be able to bounce back faster and, and be stronger because of it. One of the things you mentioned that um, really resonates with me is, is, is the church. And, uh, and by the way, I believe that the reason America is in the situation they're in right now, uh, and, and our culture is in a situation we're in right now and is so upside down and is so broken is not because of the left. It's not because of the, uh, corrupt politics in DC. It's not because of, a uh, you know, uh, luna- political lunatics. It's, it's not because of any of those things. It's because of the church. I point the problems in our culture to the church. And, and if I go deeper, I point the problems in our culture to the to weak men in our church that are passive and not leading and not living the biblical values, that they're that they're called to live and not speaking truth and, 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 and even further to pastors who get in a pulpit and they don't have the courage to speak truth for something like protecting children, being sexualized in schools and libraries. When a pastor doesn't have the courage to speak about those things because he's worried about being politically correct and not offending people then uh, that is the ultimate problem in our culture. And that goes with manhood. And, 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 and you said you were not uh, attracted to the church because you thought you had to choose between masculinity and Christianity. And I recall a very specific crossroads in, in, for me in that life, my life with that same exact scenario. I made it to Afghanistan after 10 years in special operations. I'm going to go do the job that I trained 10 years to do. I'm going to go uh, in into combat. And I felt like, you know, I'm sitting in Afghanistan. I've talked about this before. I'm back Air Force Base, realizing, man, on the other side of this, I'm standing in front of this Constantino wire, these these uh, these Hesco barriers, and on the other side of this Hesco barriers, out there in the darkness, is the Taliban. And over the next few months, I'm going to try to kill them, and they're going to try to kill me. And that's about what's really going to happen. And am I ready to do that? Right? Am I ready to do that? And I and I thought, you know, am I ready to do what the Marine Corps sent me here to do? Mentally, I was in a bright mindset. I knew my job well. Physically, I was in the best shape of my life. Socially, I'm with the premier 
special operations unit in the world. Like I'm with the right guys. I had to wear a Christian stamp on a dog tag for the spiritual pillar. But at that time in my life, I believed that I had to choose between being a warrior and being a person of faith. And I thought the two couldn't coexist. And I'm like, I'm going to have to lie to people. I'm going to have to manipulate people. I'm going to have to probably kill people. And I can't be this weak Christian man that I've seen modeled for me in the church. I have to be a warrior right now. So I'll do that when I get older and later in life. But right now, I have to be a warrior. I thought the two couldn't coexist and I had to choose. And I chose to do that job without God. And, and that this decision left a giant hole inside of me that filled with hate and rage and anger and bitterness and, and a darkness took over me. And that single decision almost cost me everything. And I know on the other side of that now that there's no more strong people in the battlefield of combat or life than men of God. And so that's why it's so important to me, just like you, that we share the truth in that, that true strength, and we talk about strength, right? True strength, true resilience comes through having that spiritual pillar and having a foundational relationship with your creator. Well, and so- I got an email from a guy in his eighties. This was just a month and a half ago or so. And he's a, he's a veteran. And he said, I went on uh, Mike Glover's show and I kind of talked about some of these same, these same topics. And he goes, my entire life, I thought I could be godly or I could be tough. And so I just chose to be tough. Again, he's in his eighties, right? He's in the sage stage of his life. So he's like, I chose to be tough. And he's like, and it wasn't until I heard you describe Christ as fully lamb and fully lion that it hit me that I could have been both this entire time. Mm -hmm. And as opposed to like lamenting that, that he had like wasted time over the years, he goes, that changes now Today. from now on. Yeah. But part of the reason, Chad, and this goes back to what you're saying, the church has accepted his, its position as being downstream from culture. So how do we get woke churches? How do we get pro LGBTQ churches? How do we get these churches that want you to go along with, with getting the jab and, you know, shut down and all these different things. It's because we've let culture dictate, how we do things. And it goes all the way back. There's a great book by Eric Metaxas uh, called The Letter to the American Church. And he was talking about in the rise of the Third Reich or the, the rise of the Nazi party in Germany in the 1930s, there was a split in the German church between German Christian churches that were supporting Hitler and the rise of the Nazi party and then people that opposed the party. Mm -hmm. And I forget the, the math, so I'm not gonna, not gonna quote it, but there was a relatively small number of pastors that had they actively opposed Hitler and the rise of the Nazi party, there is no World War II in the way that we saw it. There is no Holocaust. There is no Third Reich. And it was because of these pastors that just wanted to go along to get along. They wanted to be known for what they were for, they didn't want not to that, what they were against. They, they didn't want to come off as too political. They didn't want to ruffle any feathers. They didn't want to be, be seen as judgmental, you see? And so it's those types of people that are doing the same things now because you can sound real virtuous and say, hey, I want to be known for what I'm for and not what I'm against. It's well, about, It's about Jesus. Like, well, we, like we, our, our message is on Sunday to be about Jesus, not about right. politics. But it's like, look, dummy, when you say you're for something, you say you're against everything else. If I say I am for vanilla ice cream, I'm communicating that I'm against other forms of ice cream when vanilla is available. And so these people say these bumper sticker slogans, but the problem is, is they use those bumper sticker slogans to backfill their theology, to backfill their orthopraxy, how uh, their theology works out in everyday culture, and to backfill how they do everything, how they vote, how they parent, how they love their spouses, how they provide for their community. And so it is a sickness that has come off of the backs of these weak-willed, weak-kneed men in the church. Yeah, I was just on uh, on Focus on the Family uh, with Jim Daly. And he brought up the same thing. What's the problem in the church? And and uh, you know, the problem is it's a leadership problem. It's the, sure. it's, it's a it's the pastoral problem. And it's pastors in 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 Germany, you know, pre Nazi Germany, did not have the courage to speak truth. And uh, and and Bonhoeffer spoke against it. Oh man, yeah. And, uh, and they they rejected him. And uh, and and ultimately, you know. Yeah, the yeah the the rise of Nazism and and uh, and that was, when, when they want to speak up, it was too late. And uh, and you know, man, I really I'm, I'm personal friends with Eric Metaxas, and uh, uh, he's he's uh, I've been on his show and vice versa, and uh, he's gonna come back on. And uh, that book is incredible. And by the way, you know, Bonhoeffer is one book. It's a very long read. Letters mm -hmm. to the American Church is almost a Cliff Notes version of it, and uh, very powerful, very much truth. And no one wants to hear this truth in America right now. But the message of Letters to American Church, Eric Metaxas' book, is there's no more profound message to the church uh, than because people might think not think we're in the world uh, the crufts of World War Three, but uh, whatever why it may look different than a World War Two. Uh, it's very, it's very, it's very much as important. No, I'm curious, just because it's where it's something that we're talking about, and I, I want to hear 
before we get too far ahead, I want to hear personally from you, your, your specific story. But I think also discipleship and men discipling others is something that is so missed in today's yeah, time. We don't do it. I am a Christian today because a man spoke truth into my life during mm. that time. He took the opportunity to disciple me. So at 16 years old, what was it for you? What, what made you, did somebody speak truth into your life? Was it just a natural, like, Ooh, what is this thing? What is this church thing? What is this life thing? Um, what was it? Let's dive into that story. It was all on my own because I grew up in a family that had Bibles around, but you know, in order to use it, you would have to blow the dust off of it and and use it. It was more like a colloquial kind of cultural thing. Dad was not a godly man, is not a godly man. Um, no one in the church picked up the mantle to disciple me. And I I didn't know I was supposed to be discipled. I was like, Oh, I'm in the club now. Right. I got my, my get out of hell free card. Hell seemed terrible. So I, you know, I raised my hand, made the decision. I'm not, you know, in that club anymore. And so discipleship wasn't there. Sanctification, like continued sanctification wasn't there. Technically I haven't had a spiritual mentor until about a year ago. Um, and I'm in my later thirties. And so you're, you're exactly right in the description of the problem, which is we kind of moved to the seeker sensitive model, Mm -hmm. which is let's have really impressive music, even though most of the, the, you know, performers aren't even Christians themselves. They're just like session musicians. They're really, really talented. So let's do that. Let's do the light show. Let's bring up the pastor who's, you know, wearing the latest threads. He's really funny. He's going to give you your Ted talk with a few Bible verses sprinkled over the top so they can keep their tax exempt status. Repels in. Yeah. He, and you know, <laughs> repel, it's, it's all very showy. It's all done in an hour. And I call it spiritual Skittles because it seems profound and big time but it kind of wears off before you leave the parking lot, kind of like Skittles. Like it's a big, you know, sugar pop in your system and then it's basically gone. It's empty calories. And so you get this big experience and then people just brain dead, just keep going to churches like that just for, cause I went to a church like that for over a decade yeah. and it was like, okay, I was entertained consistently, but there was no discipleship. Yeah. There was nothing pushing you further, getting you closer to Christ. And so that, that is a, a major, major issue because if you're trying to disciple your, yourself, that is counter the model that Jesus gave us with how he dealt with the apostles and then sent them, sent them out, you know, after he passed or after he, you know, ascended rather. And so that, that is a, a major, major issue. But yeah, like I wish I had a better story where like, you know, I was 18 that's years old story. and some guy with a gray, yeah, gray beard, you know, said, Hey son, let me put you under my wing. But it's, you know, I, I had to kind of figure it out. I, on think my own. A, I think it's a great story. I just, I think it's important and I'll call it out to the audience that if, if, if you're, if you call yourself a Christian and you're trying to lead and you're not discipling or looking for others to disciple, then you're missing the mark. That's right. It's the last thing Jesus commanded us to do. Yeah. Go forth and build disciples of all the nations. Like right. he, he didn't tell us not converts. Them. Yeah. Not people that, yeah, you know, you've done your spread. apologetic yeah. training, which is great. Yeah. You've answered all the questions, you know, you've, you've gained a convert. Yeah. It's okay. Conversion. Now what? Yeah. He didn't say go share the gospel. Uh, he said, go make disciples. Why? Because it's, rep, it, it's, uh, it's exponential. Yep. Right. If you, if you share the gospel, it, it, it ends with them. If you build disciples, it's exponential because they're going to, you're, you're teaching them to go pay it forward to others. Build Equipping disciples. the saints for sure. Yeah. And, uh, that, that's what we're called to do. And that's, it, that's what the body of Christ is called to do. That's the church is called to do. They're not, uh, the church as a whole is not doing that. Certainly not doing it well. No, not at all. If you're watching and wondering uh, what I'm holding here, this beautiful piece of equipment, this is the Smith & Wesson Volunteer. It's one of my favorite uh, firearms from Smith & Wesson. Uh, and uh, I am a proud ambassador of Smith & Wesson Firearms. Uh, I have been a lifelong fan of Smith & Wesson. Uh, they are one of the most iconic American companies. have been around for 170 years, making the best firearms, uh, Second Amendment uh, focused and I uh, love the people there. Um, this, from the CEO to the vice president, uh, that that have become personal friends of mine. They are supporters of our military and first responder communities. In fact, they are supporters of Mighty Oaks, which makes them uh, the premier sponsor of this show. And uh, if you are in the market for one of the best firearms out there, then uh, whether it's a rifle, a pistol, uh, for whatever reason, for hunting, for self-defense, you you need to get yourself a Smith & Wesson. Uh, you can't go wrong with Smith & Wesson. The quality, the craftsmanship, and uh, and, and the company itself is, is no way you go wrong. So check out Smith & Wesson and get yourself one of the most iconic American firearms you get your hands on. Smith & Wesson, uh, my go-to, and a proud supporter of Mighty Oaks and our military and first responder communities. All right, guys, I uh, want to thank one of our show sponsors. By the way, all the sponsors uh, for Resilience are supporters of Mighty Oaks through for our uh, military and first responder communities. Uh, no better one 
than, than Gators. Gators has been serving the military and first responder communities with the most incredible American-made eyewear for 35 years. Uh, lifetime frames. I, I Before I got involved with them professionally, I wore Gators all over uh, the world through military operations. The ballistic lenses are something I really believe in. The aluminum frames, the uh, just the clarity of the lenses, their polarization. I, I, I wore them for skydiving because they have a they have a polarized lens that allows you to see digital uh, digital screens. And so for skydiving, shooting, uh, you name it, all the crazy activities I do, I wore Gators. And then now I'm blessed to be in a relationship with them, and they're an amazing partner for Mighty Oaks. The best eyewear out there. Again, lifetime frame, American made, 35 years of uh, service to our military and first responder communities. There is no better eyewear out there than Gators. And they look super cool. So I love mine and uh, get yourself some. You talk about a lot of like super controversial topics on your show. Um, I've dealt with, I've dealt with suppression. You deal with suppression on your show. I mean, if you were talking about, you know, uh, you know, pro transgender stuff, you, your show would be at the top of that algorithm. Sure. Uh, but, but it's not, you're right. You're talking about the truth and you're speaking against, uh, evil. And, uh, so you know, how do you navigate that? Do you try to try to navigate it to be able to, you know, look for the, Hey, I'll compromise a little bit. And sometimes you, sometimes you gotta have to I'll compromise a little bit here to have the big win here. Or do you just like blaze through it and don't care? I don't self censor. Yeah. Um, I have to plan a little bit more on the front end, realizing that I have to be a little bit more intentional about potentially being canceled. So for, for that, we have a donation page on our website. Would it be easier just to have a Patreon? Things that are built out more like that? Yes. But Patreon all of a sudden can be like, well, wait, you believe crazy things like boys right. can't become girls. What's wrong with you? Yeah. And then they turn just turn off. off my Patreon. Yeah. Yeah. And so I've had to do things to make sure that I can kind of work around that. But I was telling Sean on the way over here, I work for an audience of one. And so we're, we're marching towards 600 episodes of the podcast. We've, we haven't gone a week without a show since we started in 2017. And the thing about it is, is if I worried about how the message was going to be received, like I would, I would just freeze myself. I would just be paralyzed with fear trying to please people. And so when people complain about my show, if they're complaining about uh, something that I said that I was inaccurate, I'm like, great, thank you for that correction. I want to correct that on the air. I want to correct the record. But if you just didn't like how I said it, if you didn't like my viewpoint, I'm going to say, look, there are close to 6 million podcasts on the marketplace. I would encourage you to find another one that's not going to offend your sensibilities. Like, yeah. I, what am I supposed to do? Apologize to you because you don't like the my, the way I frame an argument or the way I go in a particular direction? Like, I can't be concerned about that. And I mean, I kind of drew a line in the sand early on in my show. Episode four of the podcast was called Pussies in the Pews. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I can't think of a better name. And I asked if you guys are like, send it. Like, let's go. But I've, I've lost money. I've lost speaking opportunities because of that episode. I've even had churches say, if you could just rename that episode, we'll invite you to our church. And I'm like, hard pass, not going to do it. And it's because these people don't, they didn't engage with the content at all. They didn't listen to the episode. They just saw what it was called. And there was a word in there that they don't include in their vernacular. But I'm like, I'm, I'm not saying that to guys like you guys like you that have been in the church for 30 years and you know you you don't have the capacity to even squash a fly i'm not talking to you i'm talking to the guys that are a little bit rougher and this is just how i communicate and so that's the thing is even in those early shows when i had tens of listeners right yeah. as opposed to what we have now um i prepared as if hey i'm trying to honor god with the message that i'm putting out there and then i'm going to let the marketplace do what it does and so, yeah, you know, will we get throttled? Will we get shadow banned? Will we experience some of that? Sure. But at the end of last year, in December of 2023, we were the number 143 podcast on the Spotify platform. And that's out of over five and a half million shows on the platform. Mm -hmm. We were number 143, number two in our category. Yeah. And so it's like things that are awesome, you know, that seems self-serving to say that now, but things that are awesome aren't going to be denied, but you let the marketplace tell people whether or not they want, want you to keep talking. So about three years ago, when I burned the ships on my old career, just to focus on doing undaunted life, it was like the marketplace is going to tell me whether or not there's a place for this. And, and seemingly it's been a resounding yes, at least so far. Yeah. And you've been on guests on other podcasts. I know you just was, um, we have a mutual friend, Mike Glover. Uh, and, yeah. And I've and, been with Metaxas as well. And, you know, Chad Prather and I've been down there in Louisiana every summer for oh, yeah, the, for, uh, for, for the unashamed, unashamed fellas. Yeah, so, the, I mean, your, your episode with Mike Glover just went, went viral. He had some clips in there. It went viral. And, uh, you yep. were really, I think, it, uh, uh, you talked about, uh, a 6 PM friend versus a 3 AM friend. Versus 3 AM friend. Did I get it right? That, that was the topic that, yeah. so what's funny about that interview is, I love Mike. Mike's awesome, right? I mean, Fieldcraft and what they've done out there in Utah, it's just incredible. But 
everything I said on that podcast, I've said before. And right. I've said basically since the beginning, 2016, 2017, but the reaction was like, wait, where's this guy been? Wait, yeah. he has 500 plus episodes. Like wh where have I been this entire time? But yeah, the, the concept, this goes immediately. I'm so glad you brought that up because of the social component, right? right, right. With, with what you guys are yeah. doing. So I talk about the importance of having a foxhole, right? Having not been a military member of any kind, having never raised my hand to, you know, say that I was going to protect and serve this country. You need to have guys that when you're in your foxhole and you look to your left and right, that you're glad they're there. And the easiest way I can explain that is the difference between a 6 p.m. friend and a 3 a.m. friend. So there are guys in your life that are 6 p.m. friends. So until about 6 p.m., they're available to you. If they need you need help moving something, if you need advice, they're available until about 6 p.m. And then after that, ah, they're a little busy. Ah, you know, I'm kind of behind on my sleep. And ah, you know, I need to, their phone's not on. It's silence and notifications. Right, exactly. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta but get, then you there's those. Anyway. Yeah. There's <laughs> those <laughs> three. Anyway. Always, I'll, always, I'll always hit right. notify anyway. Yeah. But I'm then. Like, they're going to pay for this. Yeah. <laughs> You've got your 3 a.m. friends. <laughs> those are the guys that when you call them, when. And no one calls at 3 a.m. unless something's going really wrong. Yeah. These are the guys that you not only know they're going to answer, but you can hear them in the side described on his show. Like you can hear them getting their pants on, clicking their pistol into the appendix position and, you know, wrestling around in the shed for a shovel because they assume, hey, we're burying a body tonight. I don't know why. I don't know what happened, but we're, it's time to get after it. And I mean that colloquially, guys, I don't mean help your friends hide murder, right? Obviously, some people took that way too literally, but it's the guy that's just down. It's it's that... that um it's that scene from the movie, the town, right? Yeah. So fantastic movie, but Ben Affleck walks in to his, you know, best friend's place and he goes, look, you know, you can't, I can't tell you what's going on. You can't ask me about it later, but I need your help. And we're going to go hurt some people. And the guy's reaction was, whose car are we going to take? Yeah. Right. Yeah. You need guys like that in your life that are ready to throw down. Because when you have guys like that in your life, those are guys that are willing to take part of the burden off your shoulders without you having to ask them right? That's a 3 a.m. friend. That's a foxhole guy. That's a, I'm on my way guy. So, so quick story on, on that, what I mean, when my first son was six weeks old, I always get a little bit ups, upset talking about this because I just remember the fear. Six weeks old, it's my son. And second time in as many nights that we've had to rush him to the emergency room, like the children's emergency room in the middle of the night. He had some intestinal issues. We're thinking there's going to be emergency surgery on our six week old, right? He ended up having surgery. just wasn't emergency surgery. He's fine now. That's the end of the story. But I get a call from one of my guys, one of my foxhole guys, one of my three buddies named Adam. And Adam had never taken care of my dogs. He had never been around my dogs, but he called me and said, Hey, Kyle, I'm on my way to your house. Please let me know how I can get in so I can care for your animals. Now that may, that may seem like kind of like a small thing, but I, we left in the middle of the night with no regard for our animals because we were worried about our son. Mm. And yet, as opposed to him texting me being like, Hey man, praying for you, which is, which is good yeah, in yeah. and of itself. Yeah. Hey man, let me know if there's anything I can do for you. Well, that sounds good. But when you say that to somebody, what you've done is you've passed the burden to them to come up with something for you to do so that yeah. they can feel better about helping you yeah. when you're in your moment of need. He didn't do that. Right. He just said, I'm on my way. All I need from you is access to the home. Yeah. Right. How many guys, how many of you listening to this right now, when I described a 3 a.m. friend, mm -hmm. a foxhole guy, and I'm on my way friend, and you realize I have zero of those guys. Well, guess what? It's time to become one of those guys. Mm -hmm. And it's time to find one of those guys or a group of those guys. Maybe you'll find them at church. Probably not. Maybe you'll find them at a CrossFit gym. Maybe you'll find them at a jujitsu academy. Maybe you'll find them down at the, the VA Maybe you'll find them somewhere like that. Maybe you'll find them here at Mighty Oaks. But that's the problem that most of these guys run into is they don't have any of those guys. So when life gets in the way and the burden becomes too heavy, they have no one to shoulder the burden with them. I love this concept. You you might have, I don't know if you remember this, Chad, but I talked about this same exact thing, bro. So it's it's really, I love it because <clears throat> you were at my black belt um, yeah. promotion and I gave this speech. Mm. And I was talking about the power of community and what the power of jujitsu community can do. Uh, and I was, I said, you need three friends in life. You need, you need a, a truth teller, somebody that's, that's willing to call you out on your BS and tell you the truth and hold you accountable to what you say. You need a confidant, somebody that you can tell anything to, and they're going to protect that information, keep it safe. And they're going to counsel you in a way that is fruitful for you. And you need a ride or die. You need somebody that at three o'clock in the morning, you can call and say, Hey bro, I need you to get your stuff. And the only thing they say is, is I'm on my way. So you're lucky. Yeah. You're lucky in life. 
if you have one of yeah. each one of those friends, much less all of them, if you much can get one person that fits every single one of those roles, man, dude, that's yeah. a, that's a friend for life. So, yeah. so well, I was going to say to that point, uh, Matt Chandler, pastor of the village church in Dallas, fantastic pastor. I'm going to kind of butcher Phenomenal. this a little bit, yeah. but he talked about King David, how he had guys like that. Mm -hmm. He had a, one of his generals that was ride or die. He's like, where are we going and how many scalps do we need? Like he yeah. had a guy like that. Mm -hmm. Then he also had a guy that just loved him, that just loved him at a soul level, not, not in a homoerotic, homosexual way, but just at a soul level, loved Giant. David, right? Mm -hmm. And then he also had a guy that was a truth teller, right? Was it Nathan? And he basically, you know, tricked him into being like, hey, David, you're the guy I'm describing in this parable yeah, right now. Yeah, you are that man. Yeah, and so... <laughs> Yeah. When King David had that, but whenever you don't have that yourself, like that's exactly what you're talking about, right. Sean. And it's like so many guys are, are down to lament the fact mm -hmm. that they don't have it, but they're not down to do anything to fix it. Not anything yeah. to change it. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, and then you had Jonathan, which was one of those three that David had, but Jonathan, Jonathan in his, in his, in his armor bearer. Right. Uh, the yeah. Philistines are top of the mountain. The Israelites are like, they're hiding in caves. They don't want to fight the Philistines. The Philistines are laughing at them. And Jonathan, when his, when his dad, the, you know, the king goes to sleep and he's like, he looks at his arm bearer and he's like, we're going to climb this mountain. And we're going to go into the Philistine camp. I'm going to start killing people. And, and he says, wherever you go, I'm right there with you. Like, and they climbed the side of a mountain and they stopped and kept praying. And then they got in there and went inside, snuck in the Philistine camp and started slaying people. Uh, and, and then you got, so the Bible just gives such illustrations. I love, and I love, I think, I think it was Nathan that, you know, uh, King David, everybody, if, if people know about, you know, but, but, uh, Bathsheba, right. He sleeps yep. in Bathsheba and then he gets her pregnant and then he's like, oh man, I gotta, Kills I gotta get, gotta get him killed on the battlefield. He doesn't die. He comes back in town. He's like, and he's like, man, he's in a, you know, he, he, he eventually, you know, he, he has him killed. Uh, and, uh, so he kills the, you know, the husband of the woman he got pregnant and then uh, it's Nathan, right? Comes back. I, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. Some, people are like screaming. Somebody, right back. somebody will correct us. <laughs> yeah, somebody he, will yeah, correct us. He, he, yeah. he sits King David down and, he, and instead of telling him, hey man, why'd you sleep with this married woman? Why'd you get her pregnant and kill her? Instead of saying that, he says, let me tell you a story. Yep. There's a guy that comes in town. He's a rich guy. He has everything he wants. And then he sees this, this one poor guy and he, and he has this poor guy's sheep killed and, and, take, and, and kills this guy. This, this sheep was like this guy's friend is 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 his, his pet basically and, and and you come in you can buy anything you want but you kill this guy's sheep uh and he's like who is this king davis yep. like who is this guy bringing them me like i want his head basically and uh and nathan says you are you that, are that man, man. That you are that man that's you like and he calls his friend out yeah. <laughs> and uh, that's the truth that's teller, the teller he needed teller, that. Yep. Yeah. Truth teller. yeah we need that so bad and man uh, we could get off on this topic of accountability. You know, uh, we need that so bad. Our, our men, our, our society, and I'd say men because we're men. And, and so I, I, I'm talking to men, w women need it too. But the lack of accountability that men have in today's world leads to weak societies. And that's a huge problem that we're dealing with in our world today. Well, and part of the problem with why some men don't have accountability is because they've either never, you know, deputized a guy in their life to be the guy to give them accountability or when they have given a guy in their life, you know, permission to be that guy, the first time that they check them, they get all ego driven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey man, you don't know me. You don't know my path. You, you don't know anything about that situation. They let ego get in the way. And it's just kind of like, dude, this, you asked me for this. I put some relational chips in the center of the table and risked parts of our friendship to try to lovingly correct you. And this is how you respond. What are the odds that that's, that guy's going to lovingly correct you again? Yeah. And so it's like, we're literally keeping the exact antidote to becoming a crappy man out of our lives. And we're doing it to ourselves. Guys, if you don't have precious metals, uh, you got to get your hands on some. Uh, the world is not a stable place. Our banking system certainly is not a, a stable place. So it's important to have precious gold and silver on hand. Uh, for me, precious gold, precious silver, and, uh, and also precious lead uh, to be able to protect yourself. But look, if you uh, are not already into this, you need to go to MidasGoldGroup.com. Uh, our friends there are incredible people. They're incredible patriots. Uh, they love America and they have the best uh, resources on precious metals. Uh, the owner, James Clark, is a Marine Corps veteran. Uh, he's a patriot and he is uh, my friend also. And they're just incredible people who know this market inside and out. 
and you can go there. And if you mention my name, Chad Robichaud, you will get free silver. You'll get some free silver and uh, you can invest in precious metals and have tangible precious metals on hand uh, in a time of need uh, when, the, when those financial markets go down. Go to myschoolgroup.com and get your precious metals today. Guys, uh, you heard me say before, you will never hear me promote something that I don't use and don't believe in. One of the supporters of this show is, is BioPro. Uh, I am a believer in this product. and offers you a complete growth factor profile. I mean, you're talking about improving your sleep, uh, growing muscle, releasing your own uh, growth hormones in your body, improving your metabolism, just bone density, uh, the, the way you feel your overall mood, your sexual desire, your libido, all these just incredible things that, uh, that or come naturally if you could trigger it from your body. As BioPro does that for you. I, there's a lot of benefits I, I've, I've heard of from other pro athletes that take this uh, from special operators. But for me personally, uh, uh, I, I've, I've definitely noticed the increase in recovery. But the biggest thing I've noticed for me is my sleep. Uh, sleep's important to me. Uh, I function well with all the stuff I have to do, from speaking, from writing, to do, running Mighty Oaks, to uh, doing podcasts like this and and uh, and going on international operations, like I have to have good sleep in order to be able to function at my highest level. And I was not getting it. I would sleep like four or five hours a night. It was it was kind of choppy, and I was doing all kind of things for years. And as soon as I started taking BioPro, uh, I started getting eight to nine hours of solid sleep. That's why I'm just hammering home how much I love this product. Uh, the people there are absolutely amazing. They're supporters of our military and first responders. They support Mighty Oaks. Uh, and the product is absolutely incredible. You have to try it. Uh, go to BioPro. And if you enter the code BioPro30, you'll get 30% off. That's not my code. Uh, I actually don't want a code. I want you to get 30% off. And uh, so enter BioPro30 and you get 30% off. Uh, get yours today. People in the communities, people in church, unchurch, no, it's people in general, but uh, especially people in church, they are hearing all these politically divisive things, uh, LGBTQ, like like uh, the mutilation of children, like all this stuff. And, and we want truth. We want answers. And, and people should be able to go to the church for answers. People should be able to go to church for truth. And if they go to their church and they, and they don't find those answers, they're going to go seek it elsewhere. Yeah. So what, what responsibility does a pastor have with that? I mean, I mean, I mean, the responsibility is ultimate. And this is how I say <clears throat> there, I think it's in Hebrews. I can't remember the exact reference off the top of my head, but pastors will have to give an account someday for how they shepherded their flock. Yeah. Because God gave you your flock. That, that's, those are his sheep. You need to be asking God, what do you want me to say to your sheep? Right. That's kind of like your primary goal. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to have to give an account to God someday for how I shepherded my listeners on my podcast because I'm not a pastor. I don't pretend to be a pastor, right? I don't have Rev before my name or something like that. I'm just a dude. Yeah. I'm just a dude that was able to afford a microphone and technology to put it out there on the interwebs. Yeah. And so if you're relying on guys like me, a, you know, a parachurch ministry to provide the answers to, to your folks, that that's okay. But ultimately, it, it, the, the, re, the responsibility falls on you. And so part of you doing that is bringing in guys like me that are experts at this issue, being, bringing in guys like y'all to come and talk about, you know, military issues or PTSD or any of those types of things. But you're not going to get a pass someday because this was a hot topic. Mm -hmm. God's just going to understand, oh yeah, you never talked about the fact that we shouldn't shave off pieces of little girl's arms sew it into this phallic like shape and sew it onto the top of the groin of a young girl. So she feels like she has a penis because she's gender confused. Yeah. What? Yeah. It's a hot topic and we need to be in those hot topics. But again, most Christians just, they're very comfortable with being comfortable. They're like, ah, oh, this is going to rock the boat. Not everyone's going to like this. Yeah. You weren't called to make everyone comfortable. Pastor. I also think it's fear. I think it's, of course it's, it's this lack of, you know, men that, that have done hard things in life and are willing to, stand for truth, even though it's hard and they fear the consequences. And yeah. I've said this before, I think even on this show and, and as, as what God calls us to is obedience and obedience doesn't determine the consequence. You make the decision to do what's right, no matter what the other side looks like. And right, that right. takes a true strong man is what we're talking about is why we need strong men leading churches. And we need to get strong men back into churches because if we don't, then nobody's going to be willing to tackle these hot topic issues because they're scared to do so. And that's yeah. a tragic thing. 
yeah, you know, pastors, I hope pastors are listening. Uh, time, time to, time to step up and speak up, kind of shift up on the end there to, to a little bit more of your personal life. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, we, you know, I know Sean's black belt in jiu-jitsu. I'm black belt in jiu-jitsu. Uh, love jiu-jitsu. And, and as you talk about the pillars of resiliency and, and, uh, you know, the, uh, I said on this, on this show, talking about resiliency and your mind, body, spirit, social, I know in, in yours, you talk about not only, uh, you know, mentally and, and spiritually being strong, but physically being strong and, 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 you know, eating healthy, taking care of your body, doing, uh, things like jujitsu, uh, talk about that. Talk about your personal life. Some of the things you do, um, about, uh, making sure you're physically resilient, physically ready for all the hardships of life. Yeah. So I'm, I'm a purple belt in jujitsu. So I'm officially two rungs less of a man than you two. So thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> I have a four degree. So I, yeah, you know, it's, yeah, God, six, that's six. six. I can't count. I can't count that high. Yeah, six, six rungs down. I'm yeah. Like, but, but you know, I'm not being, yeah, you're not te- bragging. I don't be too technical. As you brag. <laughs> no, like, yeah. too technical. so I, I'm 37. I started training jujitsu at the age of 30. And, you know, I, I've done everything that could be done in a ball sport, right? Baseball, football, you know, soccer. I played collegiate soccer. Like, I've, I've done all the ball sport stuff. And you I, was know, always, I gotta I jump in, though. You know what I say about that? Like, I prefer sports that take two balls, not one. Ah. And uh, that's, 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 that's jiu-jitsu. That's oh, jiu-jitsu. Is that right? I just got to say that. He yeah. said it. Yeah, base, just, baseball, soccer, it. football, all great sports. That's one, spoken one, like a guy that sucked at all the other sports. One, that's what that sounds one like. One ball, one ball in those, two balls. You couldn't hit a baseball, so you're like, <laughs> baseball sucks somehow, I think. <laughs> that's actually right? so, that's, that's what it sounds and, like. And obviously, I didn't do good at basketball. Yeah. Uh, a little vertically challenged. Why obvious? <laughs> well, that's not why it's not so obvious. I didn't, I didn't get the uh, the leg extensions. Right. Right. Once right. I get the leg extensions, I'm gonna be dunking. Yeah. Well, I, so I'll say this. So I have guys that listen to the show because we're you know we're all about resilience, and they're like, oh, so what can I do? It's like you got to start training jujitsu. Yeah. Because it's like, if you got an ego problem, you need to train jujitsu. If you're a little too fat, a little unflexible, a little weak, you need to train jujitsu yeah. because jujitsu will kind of find your faults. Right. So let's say you're naturally very strong, but not naturally very flexible. Well, you're going to get into positions where gosh, darn it. You wish you were a little bit yeah. less strong, a little bit more flexible yeah. and vice versa and things sure. like that. But there's no, like, there's no bigger microcosm for life maybe than jujitsu other than a burpee, a burpee, you get down <laughs> and then you get back up and then you just have to keep doing that. And it yeah. sucks every time, but then you just have to get better at it. Yeah. But with jujitsu, it's like, it does not matter who you are. It does not matter how good you are there's always someone better yeah. unless you're Gordon Ryan, but there's always somebody that's better than you. There's always somebody that's a little bit more explosive, has a little bit more of a gas tank, has a little bit more technique in a certain position that you have a little bit less technique. You're going to find the hammer someday. You may be the hammer in your gym. There's a hammer out there waiting for you and you're just simply going to be the nail. And so if you're a man out there, I, I answered an email this morning from a listener. <clears throat> hey, how do I you know, get my kids to be more spiritually, mentally, and physically resilient. I was like, well, they need to see dad doing hard stuff. They need to see dad doing jujitsu. They need to see dad powerlifting. They need to see dad reading books that are a little bit beyond his intellect. They need to see dad engaging in cultural topics that are a little bit incendiary so that when you ask them to do the same or lead them down the pathway to do the same, you don't have to say something stupid as their father, like, ah, do as I say, not as I do. It's a whole lot easier to follow someone as they do something silently than follow someone that's just barking an order at you. And so, yeah, I mean, I can't be a bigger advocate for doing jujitsu. I mean, we we rep uh, origin uh, on our podcast and they make, you know, the best geese, the only geese that are 100% made from the hands that make it to the materials that make it right here in the United States of America. Jocko. Jocko Yeah. That's, that's Jocko and and Pete from origin. Yeah. By the way, if you guys are, don't know who Jocko is, I think everybody knows who Jocko is probably listening here, but uh, be be praying for him and and a victory MMA team there. They just had a, they just had a fire. Yeah. And, and yeah, I think they're the facilities gonna be shut down for like six months. Yeah, yeah. it's bad too. Yeah, they're really, yeah. really bad. It's gonna be rough, but you know, the, the fire department hopped in there. And thank God for those first responders. They saved the building and there were no the no injuries as far as I know. But yeah, I mean, a lot of people got into jujitsu because of Jocko, and then there's people that kind of come off of the Jocko podcast tree yeah. and you know start talking about the the wonders of jujitsu. And the thing is, is you gotta be resilient because you're gonna get injured, right? Yeah, you're gonna have things that that come up that you you can't avoid. And you're going to get, you're constantly going to have little bumps and bruises. You might break a nose, you might get called flower, but those are, those are symbols of resilience earned. Like you're going to get stripes on your belt, but then you're also going to get stripes on your soul that says, you know what? But I remember like how we do a uh, shout out to the forge in Edmond, Oklahoma. That's where I train. We do promotion nights th- throughout the year. So two, th- maybe three times a year, all the people that are getting promoted, whether it's to blue, purple, brown, or black, they're all going through their promotion at the same time. And we'll have about a hundred people on the mat. 
running, you know, bull in the ring kind of gauntlet on these guys. And I've gone through two of those promotions, you know, when I was promoted to blue and then I was pr promoted to purple belt over two years ago. And my thing is like, I can only control me. I can control the level of cardio I put into this, but the whole point is no matter what your cardiovascular ability, we're, we're going to pound you into the ground. And if you're not tired yet, we're just going to keep going. Yeah. But what I can control, I can't control whether or not I get subbed by a guy that's been training for 15 years. I can't control whether or not I'm going to get into a bad position, you know, with a black belt ogre, but I can control who stands up first. Yeah. And I'm going to like, after I tap, I'm standing up before he does. And that's well, just that little bit. Like I'm going to be resilient. I'm just going to show. The truth is, 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 we live in a super, super convenient world and that makes us soft. And now I know, yeah. I know there's places in the world that don't have convenience. I'm not talking to them. I'm talking to the, to our communities. We we're man, snap of our fingers. Food is here. You know, any TV show we want to watch without commercials, so much convenience that we have to deliberately and intentionally put ourselves into uncomfortable situations Yep. and jujitsu like other things, but jujitsu being one of the best teachers of resilience mm. does that you're going to get put in really, really uncomfortable positions and you're going to have to learn how to make micro adjustments yep. to improve your position in that situation. And that's, a, that's the story of life. You know, there's this, this people want things so fast, but really what you need to do to be successful is to make micro adjustments every single day. Mm. To get better and better, one percent better every single day. It's just like life. Being a husband, ends. being a, being a husband, being a father, being an employee, being yep. a, being a leader of an organization. You have to make micro adjustments every single day mm. to improve and to get better. And if you don't do that, then you get worse. If you're not getting better, you're getting worse. Right. There's no stasis. And, nope. and the thing is, is like you, it never ends either. So whether you're you know a one stripe white belt or you're a third degree black belt you're going to find a professor or some, something. And it's like, Fourth. wait, <laughs> so, <laughs> good God. grief. My good apologies. Correction. My apologies, professor. <laughs> so fourth degree back. Well, but how do you know I was talking about you just because I pointed at you and said it. Okay. But, but I'll say, I'll say this, whether you're a one stripe white belt or a fourth degree black belt, like professor Robichaud over here, the thing is, is you will constantly find positions that you're unfamiliar with, yeah. you know, sweeps that you didn't know were there. Uh, parts of your submission that you've been doing where you've been creating space that allows for an escape that you didn't know was there. You constantly have to bring humility to the sport of jujitsu. Because again, even if you're the hammer, most of the time, there is another hammer out there waiting for you. And this is just one of those moments as well, where most men's ministries, this is how they do men's group ministry. Hey, you showed up. Congratulations. Uh, happy you're here. Um, go join that group of seven guys over there at that table, none of which who you know, and go ahead and have a seat and pour your heart out. Mm -hmm. Well, what you just described was women's ministry. Because what women do is they will circle up and connect eyeball to eyeball mm -hmm. first. But what men do left to their own devices is they will connect shoulder to shoulder first. Then they will connect in a circle eyeball to eyeball. Think about you know, hunting cultures, like if you were hunting the mammoth or whatever, like you weren't sitting around in a circle talking about, oh, how much fun it's going to be to hunt this mammoth. And, oh, I just can't wait. You were silently, stoically standing shoulder to shoulder in a phalanx type of atmosphere going towards the same goal. And for a lot of men, they haven't been in that situation since their last game of high school football, since their last mission, when they were downrange in some sort of, you know, special operations, you know, outfit from their last day on the police force, from their last day when they left the fraternity house or whatever, they haven't had that community. Mm. Jiu-jitsu provides that yeah. because you're going to war, like not real war guys. Don't, don't hear what I'm not no. saying, yeah. but in a yeah. civvy aspect. You're going to war every time you get on those mats and guess what? You survive. You make it out of there. You're a little bit more damp and you're definitely a lot more tired and you have <laughs> a lot less weight on your body, but you're doing something that's incredibly hard to do and you're getting better at the same time as everybody else. Tyler Murrah, he's a black belt um, and he's a world champion affiliated with our gym. I remember when I was a white belt and I think he was a purple belt. I had a bad class, right? Didn't do anything right. Got subbed a whole bunch. And oh, I'm a I'm stronger and better than these guys. And they beat me and blah, blah, blah. So I'm brooding in the locker room, right? Mm -hmm. Just whining, you know, pouting. He doesn't say much. He's just one of those guys. He walks into the locker room and he goes, Hey, hey, Kyle, what's uh what's going on? And I kind of tell him, Well, you know, it's rough practice. And I just kept getting in bad positions and all that. And he goes, Okay. Hey, Kyle, what would you do to the Kyle from six months ago? Mm -hmm. I'm like, 
I'd, I'd smash that guy. that guy. I'd kill him. Yeah. He goes, then shut up. We're all getting better. Yeah. You're training with the same guys for the last six months that have been training just as much or more than you have. We're all getting better. The, and he didn't say this, but this is kind of implicit in what he said is like, wait until you go to your next competition and you see how different our gym is. Wait till you go to some other gym's open mat or you, you go to the road and you take your gi with you and you go and roll with some other guys that are supposed to be on your level and you smash all those guys to pieces. It's like our gym is special, right? Yeah. We have some incredible hobbyists and some incredible guys that are building a career out of jujitsu. And you don't realize how amazing that is until you go and travel somewhere else and test your skills against somebody that doesn't know you're coming. Yeah. But I mean, it all goes back to building a foxhole of people and the type of men that you want to have around you. Jiu-jitsu just does that, you know, naturally. It's, yeah, so important. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I truly believe that some of the most personal and intimate relationships and, and conversations I've ever seen has been on, on those mats, which are back to the wall. That's right. Drenching in sweat. Breathing hard still. After practice. And after practice and people were just talking about struggles with their wives and their kids and, and uh, you know, they'll talk about, you know, a diagnosis that they just received or a job they just lost and and and, and those bonds and relationships are just on a place that I haven't seen in church. Yep. Uh, and, uh, and um, you know, and, uh, and it's, you know, amongst people, which was most one of the coolest things about it to me is, uh, you know, I remember like back when, you know, back in you know, when we first started training together, you know, yeah. 15 years ago, whatever, whenever it was, uh, it was, um, sitting across the, this, this table and we were at a restaurant and I had a guy who was on parole for selling cocaine. I had a guy who owned a, who was, had his little painting company. Caesar had a little painting Caesar, company. Yeah. He had a, a oil field exec. You had a, a, a medical doctor, uh, a, another oil field business. We all sit down and have, these guys would never meet anywhere else. But they're all sitting out laughing, haven't had dinner together. The most uncommon group of people, and that's what you see in jiu-jitsu. And they're yeah. talking about personal life, so much jiu-jitsu. Uh, they're just you know, bonded. Well, because you can trust thing. guys like that, that you've seen go through a tough situation, and they didn't fold, right? They, yeah. they, they didn't just wilt when things got hard. They didn't get the blue belt blues. Mm -hmm. They just kept working their way through it. Yeah. And you, you need guys like that, and you need people that are just going to yeah. be real with you and that you know are tough. And that's, that's one of those moments when you – Cause a lot of things, the thing about jujitsu guys as well, not all of them are tatted up. Not all of them have cauliflower yeah. ears. Some of the baddest dudes in our gym, they don't have that look. They walk into the gym after work and they've got their polo shirt tucked into their khakis and they got a nice pair of dockers on and all that. But it's like, little does anyone know if they go poking their finger in this guy's chest at some restaurant out there, yeah, yeah. it's like he gets to choose the way he's going to end the fight. Right. Yeah, yeah. And it's just like, it's so it's the confidence you get, especially for young kids. I know there yeah. are guys. Um, I had a guy, he had a son who was, very small for his age. Like I thought his son was much younger than he was because he was just very, very small. He started training jujitsu and this kid, he started walking with his chest down with his, with his head up. And he just, he wasn't letting the fact that he was going to be vertically challenged, like define the type of guy he was going to be in this world. And just the level of confidence you get, it, it's just incredible. I like this kid already. Yeah, exactly. Well, I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why you would, but uh, speaking tell, your language. Tell, tell us about your, I mean, a lot of things drive what you do. Uh, I know family is a big part of it for you. Yeah. Uh, just so, real quickly, you know, your wife, your two kids, tell us about your family and, and, and why is your family so important to you about what you do today? Yeah. I married my, my college sweetheart. We've been uh, together since 2005. And so we will have been married for 15 years this year. And we have two sons, uh, James and Eli. And the thing about it is, is that's legacy. Yeah. You know, your legacy is your progeny. And, you know, at the end of the day, let, let's say God called me home today. Mm -hmm. Well, I've left behind some devotionals, several hundred podcasts, you know, a bunch of interviews that I've been on. Um, and I've left behind, you know, an impact on some of these people. But two generations removed from now, people aren't going to remember. They're not going to remember me. They may remember some of my concepts, but they're not. Oh, who is there was a guy back in the day that said something about equipping men to push back darkness. Yeah. They're just going to carry on the legacy of the commentary not the legacy of the name. And so for me, everything that I'm doing is investment in James and Eli. And so they have to show, I have to show them what it means to be a resilient husband, to be somebody that is uh, prioritizing my wife over them. So there's a buddy of mine that <clears throat> he's talking to his wife, having a discussion and it, one of his kids comes up and he's doing the kid thing, right? Hey, hey, dad, dad, uh, dad, real quick, as he's talking to his wife. And so calmly, my buddy turns to him and says, son, I need you to realize something. If you and your mom were both drowning at the same time, not only would I jump in to save her first, but I would take the time to dry her off before I jumped in and got you. <laughs> now, he didn't mean that literally, yeah. but he was communicating to his child, 
you are important, but you're not as important as her. And so showing my boys that I love their mother to an extreme degree, like regardless of the circumstances, that's kind of priority one. Well, part of the way of doing that is providing for your family. And so this is how I'm currently providing for my family because those who don't provide for their families are worse than a non-believer. We see that in scripture. That's a haunting scripture for a male, especially if you're struggling in your career. So that's providing for my wife, providing for my kids. But I want to show my kids what a resilient man looks like because my father never went to church. Um, he never read a book. Like I never saw him pray, never saw him study the Bible. N none of these things that are core to who I am as a man today. I don't want to, my, I don't want my kids to accidentally find those habits at some point down the road because most guys don't pick up those habits. Yeah. Like reading books and, you know, working out all the time, like that stuff's really hard. And most people don't do those types of things, but I want my kids to see that as normal. Yep. And so it's my job as their parent to be a resilient man for as long as possible. I posted a video that, that kind of went viral on our page where my three-year-old challenged me to a foot race and I just, I dusted him. Right. They're like, and some of the comments were like, why didn't you let him win? I was like, one day he will have earned it. Yeah. Cause my job is to push that date as far into the future as possible. But the day that James beats me in a foot race, that's not going to be a sad day for me. That's going to be so, a day to where it's like, yeah. Heck yeah. We finally found the crossover point, but that's just a, a thing for me is it's going to take daily discipline and resilience to be able to not only provide for my family, but to show them that no matter what dad's going to be here. Yeah. And I'm, you know, I'm willing to storm the gates of hell and come back with the heads of demons in order to provide for y'all mm -hmm. and to show y'all that I'm here for you. Mm -hmm. And you know, that pushes everything that we do. That's a foundation of it. A very wise man said, your wife is either the the launch pad for your ministry or the ceiling. And so my wife's definitely a launch pad and you know, we're here to equip men to push back darkness. That's awesome. I love that. We, you know, why, did, why didn't your son win? Well, he's not faster than me. That's right. <laughs> That's Bottom right. line, he's not faster than me. He's slow. His little short legs ain't good. That's yet. right. <laughs> A uh, serious question in this on, you know, with all the, uh, you know, the considering global warming and the increase in sun rays, what's it like? What's life like being a ginger? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I thought we were going to make this entire episode without you saying something that was deeply racist and bigoted and ginger phobic. Um, here's the thing. Um, my wife, yeah. she has a thing for gingers, which makes her a very strange, she's a very odd duck, right? She's like attracted to that. She's very disappointed that both of our sons weren't gingers. And I tried to inform her, I was like, babe, that's a line item in our budget that we don't have to have, which is sunscreen. Because yeah. I have to have SPF, like, <laughs> you know, a thousand, like I need like, you know, an IV putting SPF directly into my veins. But here's the thing. I just avoid the sun chat. The sad, the sun can't do anything for me that a little vitamin D pill can't do for myself. But I will tell you, I've avoided sunburns for a very, very long time. I have a great track record. I have sunscreen basically on me at all times and it's okay. Like it's okay. I can't be as spontaneous as some of, some of you people that, you know, you're, pro uh pro tan people or whatever i should call you you people pro melaniners we don't even know what color uh sean is you can't see his can't see him with the beard yeah he's <laughs> hiding by what are you hiding sean that's right yeah that's right but yeah it's it, fine i've made it this far and i plan to keep going at some point well i don't know how but my, i have a ginger daughter so uh i mean i guess i got a little bit of red in this beard people yeah. tell me so. yeah i'm Irish and Scottish and a little bit of Choctaw Indian, but I didn't get any, you can't yeah, visibly yeah. see any of the Indian heritage at all. Yeah, I didn't get any Choctaw. Not at all. <laughs> yeah. Besides being in Oklahoma, that's about it. That's right. That's it. Oh, I know. Yeah. You know, not only you afflicted by the sun, but you you said you don't like the cold either. Oh, you have not done a cold plunge yet. No. Uh, and it's been a, been a, uh, on the radar for you to do a cold plunge. And so we're going to leave here and go to my house. And, uh, and so if you want to watch it, we're going to have some video, uh, video content. We're going to video it. And Kyle's going to do his first cold plunge. So if anyone out there listening to this thinks that Chad is a nice guy and accommodating, oh, that Chad, he sees such a minch. No, what Chad did is I was at your house and your lovely bride made me dinner. And I'm thinking this is just going to be a nice, yeah. jovial, positive environment. You're like, hey, Kyle, let's go outside. I'm like, oh, I bet he's going to show me his dope backyard. That's great. No, 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 no. You walked me up to the torture chamber that you're going to put me in. <laughs> yeah. Not then, but today. Yeah. And so, so it was hard and, and for and me to I, sleep. Then I showed Think you that my, 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 uh, you know, 120 pound wife, uh, right. five foot, three, five foot two wife that, that she yeah. does, she does it. And she's just casually <laughs> dropping. Oh yeah. I do it all the time. Yeah. But and I so. will say this. So shout out to Mike Dragic. He's an alligator wrangler, bare knuckle boxer, MMA guy out of Florida. He's a great dude. He runs a, a great ministry out there uh, for veterans as well. But he, um, he told me this one day and I was like, crap, he's right. 
because I told him like, ah, you know, look, man, I do hard stuff all the time. I don't need to get in a cold plunge and show people how tough I am and put it on Instagram and all this kind of stuff. He goes, okay, well, as long as you're okay with making an idol out of your fear of cold water, I guess that's, that's fine. Yeah. And I was just like, you he's, he's son right. of a he's gun, right. <laughs> but he's absolutely right. Because it's like, I have been avoiding the cold. Now I, to be, to be fair, I have not had an opportunity to get in a cold That's plunge that I have avoided. That's Stop. You shut your mouth, Sean. I have not. You got a bathtub at home? No, you got a bathtub? Cold water no, we, 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 no bathtubs. We bathe outside <laughs> yeah, with a hose. So yeah, we're very right. poor, Sean. So thanks for bringing that up. I'm a ginger. I'm poor. Like we can't afford indoor plumbing. Thanks a lot. So yeah, we still use an outhouse. But uh, yeah, so I haven't had the official attempt at it, but we are going to luckily do that for, for your today, audience and today. probably my Instagram. It's going to happen here in true, a few hours. It's true hours. friends hold well, each other accountable. Well, before, before you go, we got, got some gifts. Uh, got a Mighty Oak swag bag here. And, very uh, good. Very he's good. Already, he's already wearing the hat. My, yeah, got the hat. Yeah, because you're wearing shirt. mine, so I didn't want to hey, wear we should the highlight one. the hat, by the way. Y'all check out this hat. And that this, dope. Is the, yeah, this, this is Sean's this undaunted Kyle's, hat. Kyle's oh, undaunted no, hat. Yeah, you're yeah, looking yeah, at me. Yeah. So. Kyle's yeah. undaunted hat right here. Well, now, crap, guys. Now I'm going to have to get more in stock. Yeah. It's super nice. Yeah. It really is. Branded Bills, man. They make the greatest hats in the world. Very comfortable. Uh, That's your logo. If there. you look at the price on it, you're like, Tribute man, to the line of he's pretty proud of those caps. They're pretty expensive. It, it's, oh, they're dude, expensive they're expensive to these make. are very so expensive, expensive to get made, yeah. and, but they're very quality. So that, yep. there's a reason for the price. Um, they're also virtually completely water resistant. Yeah, should so. we test it right here on camera? Should oh, I should. pour water on your head <laughs> just a little bit? <laughs> we'll, hey, we'll it's up to you. We'll there's all this it. new equipment that it's waterproof, right? <laughs> so, a copy of an unfair advantage, uh, a copy of saving Aziz, and and let's see, these are. The, it's about resilience. Uh, one of the things we do in our resiliency speaking events is we give these books out uh, to the troops. We get away about 400,000 copies of these now. Nice. Path to Resiliency, The Truth About PTSD, Not the Solution. Uh, this book, uh, Not the Solution, is brand new. Uh, so this is kind of first getting a hard yeah, copy of it. Very good. But, You're the first. But it's free to everyone. Uh, so notthesolution.com. You go there, download a copy for free. You don't have to be in the military or first responder. It's free for everyone. You can buy a copy if you want. Uh, you can buy a copy for our troops because we'll give them away. But if you want a copy, it's free. Uh, our nation is feeling is is in a suicide epidemic worse than ever before in the history of our country. And uh, not the solution. Winning the battle against suicide has the solution uh, to about to winning that battle. So go not to not the solution dot com and get a free copy. And okay, here we go. Uh, one of our sponsors for the show. Our sponsors different like to thank. Uh, guest and I want to thank you Midas Gold Group Midas Gold Group is a veteran owned uh, precious metals company and I always say I mean, it's important to have tangible gold and silver for the apocalypse you got to be That's ready right. for the apocalypse when the digital currency goes down uh, and, and have a lot of lead as well but uh, this is a silver uh, silver eagle silver dollar uh, not silver dollar silver eagle it's an ounce of silver and as a gift to you. Very good. And Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And if anybody else wants one or wants gold or silver, they go to MidasGoldGroup.com, mention my name and get some free silver. So as well. Can they, but what if people can't spell your name right? Does, did they get like less silver or anything like I that? Think, or I think if you just said the chat, just on, chat. The chat on the podcast. Okay. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> Chad Robachaw. Yeah. That, that works. Robichaw, Robichaw, that, Robichaw, Robichaw. that Cajun sounding yeah. Chad guy. Yeah. yeah. They'll, they'll get it. Man, it was, it was super awesome to have you on, bro. Thanks a lot. Uh, Appreciate you. Proud of what you're doing, Sean, man. Sure and, <laughs> yeah, we'll go okay. lefty shake when we get up. <laughs> yeah, super proud of what you're doing. Uh, yeah, people need your voice. Happy Thank to you. be here, man. Thank you. See you guys next time. What's up, guys? Sean here, one of your hosts at Resilient. Thank you for watching the show. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any bonus content in future episodes. We have some amazing guests that share their story of resilience and you won't want to miss it.